Hi, and welcome to the fourth lecture in a series of 12 lectures on William Shakespeare's Hamlet. And in my last lecture, I misspoke again. I uh, said that Hamlet meets the ghost in Act 1, Scene uh, 5, but he meets the ghost in Act 1, Scene 4. He has his private rendezvous with the ghost in Act 1, Scene 5. And let's pick up where we left off last time. I'm on page 1415 in your anthologies, Act 1, Scene 5. And remember, the ghost has just exited the stage. Hamlet is all alone. And he speaks his second soliloquy. He's in a highly emotionally charged state, very agitated and very excited. And he cries out, he calls out, Oh, all you hosts of heaven. Oh, earth, what else? And shall I couple hell? So here Hamlet, of course, is calling upon the forces of good. And in addition, should he call upon the forces of evil as well? He's wondering if he should do that because he's ready. This is a man who's ready to fulfill his mission, uh, to follow through uh, on the ghost commandment. And here he's stirred uh, uh, to, to, uh, to kill, to murder. And he cries out, O oh, fie, hold, hold my heart, and you, my sinews, grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. So he calls upon his heart, the hold, hold, he's uh, again the heart, he's symbolizing his emotions, he needs to try to stay focused, he needs to not be carried away, he needs to uh, be able to proceed and uh, think clearly. And uh, his sinners here, he needs his strength, he needs courage to proceed, to move forward. And next he says, uh, remember thee. I, thou poor ghost, whilst memory holds a seat in this distracted glow. Remember the ghost's last line uh, in exiting the stage was, uh, remember me. And uh, here we see this line resonated with Hamlet. Uh, remember the, yes, he will remember the ghost. Uh, if the ghost is tempting Hamlet, if the ghost is a goblin damned and is tempting Hamlet, well, he obviously, uh, that with that line, with that exit line, he obviously has Hamlet uh, uh, in his uh, control now. Because uh, remember, Hamlet is deeply troubled, deeply... Uh, uh, upset that uh, no one at court, especially his mother, uh, remembers his father, uh, and that that is what most disturbed him, as we saw uh, in his first soliloquy. So the idea that he might forget his father, uh, that is that idea is too great for him to even imagine, uh, too awful for him to even imagine. So remember thee. He, he says, yes, he will. I, thou poor ghost, whilst memory holds a seat in this distracted globe. Notice the metaphor, uh, this distracted globe. Uh, Hamlet's brain, obviously the man is distracted. The young prince is distracted. He's confused. He's conflicted. And uh, he he has to find a way to proceed forward. And here at last, he thinks at this moment that he has a way to proceed because now uh, he will have one goal, one aim, one intention only. Whilst memory holds a seat in this distracted globe, remember thee, and he repeats that phrase, remember thee. And remember, again, I'll point out that when a phrase repeats, a word or a phrase uh, repeats uh, in the text of pay special attention to that because it's important. And again, that idea of remembering his father, this is of uh, 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 most importance to Hamlet. He says next at the top of page 1416, Yea, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all saws of books, all forms, all pressures past that youth and observation copied there, and thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter. Notice again the metaphor here, the table of my memory. 
He's going to wipe away all trivial fond records, all saws of book. This is uh, all, all the knowledge that Hamlet has acquired. Remember, he is a, a student at the university, and uh, he uh, has done uh, quite a bit of reading. And uh, he's uh, quite the observer, and he keeps records. He keeps journals like you do. He keeps journals. He keeps notebooks of all the observations that he's made from his experiences. So he's gathered quite a bit of knowledge and quite a bit of information, and he's willing to dispose of all that. He's willing to wipe all that knowledge, all that learning. He's willing to wipe it out from the table of his memory. The table of his memory, uh, that metaphor again, from, from uh, 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 what's been recorded in his brain here, uh, in his youth. And he's willing to wipe that out and replace it with what? Thy commandment. Thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain unmixed with baser matter. So he sees all of the learning that he's acquired as baser matter. Now there's only one thing that matters, one thing that is of importance, one, uh, one thing that is significant, that's relevant, and that is the ghost commandment. And notice the word again, commandment, which is suggestive of an authority figure and uh, reminds us once more of Hamlet's Christian teachings, his Christian upbringing. And he's ready to replace all of his acquired uh, uh, experience, uh, uh, information, all of his experiences in life and replace it with this one commandment all alone. He wishes to obey the ghost command. And the ghost, of course, uh, in the position of the authority figure here as Hamlet's father. Uh, yes, by heaven. Oh, most pernicious woman. Now, isn't this interesting? Isn't this ironic? Uh, one commandment all alone is going to live. The ghost commandment all alone is going to live within Hamlet's brain, within the book and volume of his brain. The entire book will have only one. One thing of one thing uh, 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 that matters, one thing that is significant within the book. And here, what's happening here is his attentions, his thoughts are turning now. They're being diverted away from this one commandment. And now his attentions turn once more to his mother. <clears throat> he cries out, oh, most pernicious woman. So we can see that his globe is still distracted. He's still confused and conflicted. And uh, once again, this raises uh, uh, this idea of his desire to revenge himself on those who have desecrated his father's memory, and especially, particularly his mother, who married with his uncle so, so quickly. She posted to incestuous sheets so quickly after his father's death and his thoughts return to her. It isn't any surprise that they do because remember the ghost in telling uh, uh, his, his story uh, reminded Hamlet of Gertrude and uh, he called Gertrude uh, uh, his, uh, all, uh, his all seeming uh, virtuous queen. Uh, suggesting that she was, she did commit adultery. She uh, was an adulterer and committed adultery while uh, the elder King Hamlet was still living. And uh, so his attentions turn from the commandment, and now he's fixated once again on his mother. And uh, then he brings up Claudius, doesn't he? <clears throat> My tables. He says, oh, uh, oh, most pernicious woman. And then he thinks of Claudius. Oh, villain, villain, smiling, damned villain. My tables, meet it as I set it down, that one may smile and smile and be a villain. At least I am sure it may be so in Denmark. The touch of the scientist there, he's 
his experiences are those that he's observed, right, that he's collected here in Denmark, and he makes the observation that he's certain that one may smile in Denmark and yet be a villain. So his attentions again turn to his uncle, and we see uh, uh, that he believes what the ghost has told him, that the ghost is an honest ghost, the ghost has told him the truth, and he sees Claudius here as the villain. Uh, this brings us back to uh, the cultural codes uh, discussion that we uh, had in our last lecture. Remember, uh, cultural codes, uh, a cultural code is a set of beliefs that people hold within a particular culture, and uh, they attempt to live uh, uh, according to those beliefs. And there is the cultural code of uh, uh, the cultural code of personal ambition. Uh, it's basically the idea is what, what does it mean to be a man? And for the man who uh, subscribes to the cultural code of personal ambition, it's the idea, well, it's the idea, uh, the personally ambitious man, and Hamlet sees Claudius as a personally ambitious man, the personally ambitious man sees himself as a realist, uh, but uh, ironically, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, a man whose emotions, whose desires, whose psychological desires uh, overwhelm his ability to reason, to be rational, and therefore to be ethical. But the man of personal ambition is the man who will stoop to any means to attain power. Uh, will attempt, uh, uh, it's the, the end that justifies the means for this type of individual. And he will do whatever it takes, whatever is necessary to acquire power, material gain, wealth, position, authority, privilege. And uh, once he's attained that power, he'll do anything to maintain it as well. So he'll lie if he needs to, he'll cheat. He'll steal. He will even kill if it's required in order for him to gain that power and to maintain it once he has it. So the man of uh, personal ambition uses his intelligence, but uh, uh, uses it to scheme for himself to gain control and therefore is thinking irrationally because he's forgotten. The man of personal ambition has forgotten the basic scientific facts, right? And that is the, the idea that uh, conscious sentient beings can suffer. They can feel pain. And it really doesn't matter which brain is in pain. Rationally speaking, it doesn't matter which brain is uh, suffering, is, is being tortured, is in pain. That a brain in pain, as we said in class, is a brain in pain. So to think that uh, one's own pain matters more than uh, someone else's pain, rationally speaking, is, uh, is to be misled, to not be thinking clearly, uh, to not be thinking logically. Psychologically speaking, of course, we, we would rather other people, most of us would rather other people uh, be in a state of torture or torment rather than ourselves. But rationally speaking, we can see that it doesn't really matter which brain is in pain, which brain is in a state of dissatisfaction or need or want or, or uh, suffering. Rationally speaking, uh, there, there's no difference. And that can extend to other conscious sentient organisms as well, it can be, extend beyond the human species. It doesn't matter, ultimately, rationally speaking, a brain in pain is a brain in pain. And uh, so the man of personal ambition has misunderstood the basic facts, uh, the scientific facts. And remember, when we add those facts together, we can arrive at these philosophical truths, these values, these most important values. And so we know that uh, we would not want someone else to harm us to put our brains in these 
states of dissatisfaction or unhappiness or cause us to suffer. So therefore, we are obligated ethically not to cause other people to suffer, uh, to uh, strive toward a civilized community where we're not harming one another. So you can see how the man of personal ambition is both is, is thinking irrationally and behaving unethically when he schemes, when he uses his intelligence to satisfy his own personal needs, his own desires. So uh, he's behaving not like a man of reason, not like a realist, uh, but rather uh, uh, he's behaving uh, as if uh, he's not using his ability to think rationally. Uh, and to understand the uh, the the scientific data before him and the uh, philosophical uh, truths that 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 are determined by that uh, those observations, and this is how Hamlet sees his uncle. Now, recall, we're still not sure of the ghost uh, true status and what his intentions are, what his purpose is. Uh, so we only have the ghost word that Claudius is this kind of man, that Claudius is the villain of the piece of the story here. So we always have to keep that in mind. We always have to be skeptical of the ghost. Remember, that's one of the uh, deterministic uh, causes uh, behind Hamlet's delay. Uh, I've argued that that's one of the uh, causal components behind Hamlet's delay in uh, avenging uh, the death of his father. You can think of all of these uh, causal factors or features, think of them as ingredients, if you will, and you're just pouring each, each one of these causes into the blender and you're turning the blender on and, and what you have, uh, you have this concoction at the end, all of these components, causal components coming together and you have this concoction in the end that supports your thesis idea, right? That Hamlet's delay is not caused by one, is not the result of one particular cause, but rather by a, a number, several causes. And again, uh, it would be extremely di difficult, if not impossible, to to know all of the causes behind Hamlet's delay. So we're simply focusing on uh, approximately eight, nine, or ten causes here in, in the uh, text. <clears throat> so he says, uh, oh, it's also interesting here too, isn't it, uh, that here Hamlet is, he's ready, uh, he, he sounds like the classical Avenger. He sounds like the ancient Greek, the ancient Roman warrior uh, who's been given his task and is ready to march forward and do battle and uh, seek out the villain and, and revenge himself uh, uh, and uh, without any qualms, without any hesitation, is ready to move forward and uh, get that mission accomplished. He's the man of action. It sounds as if he's, he's Hamlet stirring himself up to become this man of action, uh, to become this stereotypical classical Avenger. And yet, what does he do instead? He doesn't pull out his sword and uh, hunt down Claudius at this moment. Instead, he pulls out his tables. He pulls out his notebook, his journals, and he makes yet another observation in his journal here, that one may smile and smile and be a villain. He makes that observation in his journal. And this, I, I would argue, is yet another uh, deterministic feature, another causal factor in Hamlet's delay. And that is that Hamlet is a man of introspection. He uh, has been conditioned by his studies at the university, I would argue, to be a man who thinks, who introspects, who ruminates, who philosophizes, and who does observe the world around him. Like a good scientist, he goes out into the world and he observes that world and he records his findings in his notebooks, in his journals. 
And like the good philosopher, he adds those facts together and he uh, 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 arrives at uh, these uh, philosophical uh, truths. Uh, you know, it's interesting, as a side note here, it's interesting that many people uh, believe that Shakespeare could not possibly have written these plays because of his particular circumstances and upbringing and uh, education and, or lack thereof. But it's interesting, you know, Shakespeare living in a Stratford-upon-Avon living in a uh, little country village, I imagine that very early he was, uh, sort of, you know, went out in, into uh, nature and uh, made observations. I, I can, you know, I'm only conjecturing here. I'm just speculating, but I, I can imagine Shakespeare keeping journals and notebooks and observing the world around him and discovering these scientific uh, uh, truths, these facts, or uh, collecting all of that data, and of course, uh, observing people too in the village. And then we know that he was uh, a great reader. So I imagine he had, uh, you know, that's where his skills in language, I'm, I remember I'm saying that, uh, I'm arguing that uh, we live in a deterministic or the uh, deterministic universe, that's how the realist, that's how the plot, that's what the play is showing us, that it's a deterministic universe we live in, and that Shakespeare was probably from very early on programmed to be the scientist, to be the philosopher, and uh, his skills with language and his knowledge uh, uh, of language and uh, history and so forth, uh, I would imagine it, come, it, it, it was a result of his uh, being such a, uh, a great reader. So, but anyway, that's just a side note, very much like Hamlet, I would imagine in that sense. Anyway, uh, so Hamlet whips out his journal and he starts making yet another observation just after he's, he's professed that, you know, that he will have only one, one commandment in the book and volume of his brain, and that will be to uh, revenge his father's uh, unnatural murder, murder most foul and most unnatural. And he says at the end of his soliloquy here, so uncle, there you are. That's how Hamlet sees his uncle as the man of personal ambition. And remember that's uh, the, the cultural code of personal ambition is in contrast in many ways to the cultural code of Christianity. Uh, and uh, that's the code uh, we, we discussed last time. That's the code of uh, uh, people who, uh, subscribe to this particular code, they believe in uh, uh, the Christian God who is an all-powerful and all-knowing and all-good uh, 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 supernatural entity who created the universe and uh, created human beings. And uh, Christians, traditional Christianity teaches that uh, uh, the that uh, all is divinely ordained, that there is a hierarchical order, uh, that is a divine order, that Christians, uh, again, Orthodox Christianity, traditionally speaking, Christians see themselves as sinners. They are all sinners. Remember, sin is a religious concept, uh, the idea that basically, fundamentally, uh, uh, Christians see themselves as in need of redemption, uh, in need of forgiveness. They see themselves uh, as um, um, trespassers. And so they, they're exhorted to forgive their trespassers because they themselves wish to be forgiven. And they're taught to love their enemy, to not be aggressive, to not seek material gain or, or power or wealth, or status, uh, that to renounce uh, the trappings, if you will, of this world, and to think 
of the world to come, the Christian, uh, Orthodox Christianity again subscribes to this belief in uh, a, a paradise to come, a, a Christian heaven where they will be rewarded uh, if they uh, are remained people of faith and if they remain uh, meek and humble, if they are mild, this is what it means to be a man. So you have these two contrasting uh, yes, contrasting and conflicting co cultural codes, don't you, uh, in the tale here. And Hamlet sees his father as a good Christian king, not only a great military hero, and we'll talk more next time about the cultural code of military honor. That's yet another cultural code we'll want to discuss, but I'll save that for the next lecture. But uh, Hamlet sees his father uh, not only as having been a, a great war hero, a man of, uh, uh, a fearless man, a brave, courageous man on the battlefield who confronted death and was up to the challenge. But he also sees his father as having been a good Christian king, a man who uh, uh, held to these particular, uh, to this particular set of beliefs and uh, lived the good Christian uh, was a, was a, a model of a good Christian. So we have in Hamlet's mind this idealized image of his father and this this sort of uh, uh, what's the word we need uh, this sort of I, I would argue a, a corrupted uh, image, uh, tainted image or warped image of his uncle. <clears throat> but he isn't acting like the man, like the like the uh, ancient Greek or the ancient Roman Avenger. Here, rather than grabbing his sword and charging forward to uh, find out Claudius and uh, immediately take revenge, Hamlet pauses. He's distracted. He begins to think about his mother. He begins to uh, 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 think about his uncle. He gets out his journal. He begins to make more observation in his journal. Hamlet is a man of reflection, a man who pauses and uh, uh, thinks. He's a man of introspection, uh, a man of reflection. And we'll see this again and again throughout the play, particularly uh, with the to be or not to be soliloquy, but in other uh, at other moments in the play, Hamlet will be off somewhere uh, reading a book or thinking or lo lost in thought and, and philosophizing about life, death, you know, the meaning of existence and so forth. So this uh, prevents him from moving forward swiftly. Uh, and taking care of the, uh, you know, fulfilling the commandment that the ghost has given him. So he says, now to my word, it is adieu, adieu, remember me, I have sworn it. And again, notice that the soliloquy once more mentions this phrase, remember me. And again, the idea is, you know, we hold funerals for people, uh, we... Uh, wish to remember, we hold memorial services for them. And again, you see the word memorialize and memory and the word remember uh, to show that we do remember uh, these people we cared for who have died and that we wish somehow to, to acknowledge that their lives were significant, that they, they had, uh, that they, 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 their, their existence was meaningful. And uh, this is what we do. We honor their memory we, uh, by memorializing them. And this is what Hamlet believes those at court, uh, the courtiers and the king and the queen have failed to do properly. And that is to remember his father. So when the ghost says that provocative exit line, remember me, it's the challenge. It's the challenge to Hamlet. Don't be like your mama. Don't be like your uh, like uh, the rest of the people at court. Don't forget uh, that I 
once was that uh, I uh, was in the world. Remember me. <clears throat> well, so we'll see again and again. Hamlet he becomes his own. He becomes a sort of cheerleader. His own cheerleader does, and he tries to to you know rouse himself to action again and again in the play we're going to see that he he reaches these 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 emotional heights of of uh, uh, agitation and excitement and he tries at his best to rouse himself to to carry out the ghost's injunction uh, and then we see him falling back into this uh, lethargic state this melancholy mood this uh, this this state of uh, of despondency and depression, unable to move forward, or we see him, you know, entering this introspective phase and uh, being sidetracked, being distracted from his purpose, from his uh, uh, goal, his object. Yeah, and uh, when Horatio and Marcellus enter the stage at this point. And Hamlet again in this agitated, this highly charged state, this feverish state. Uh, they want to know what has occurred, right? Horatio asks, "What news? What news, my lord?" Hamlet cries, "Oh, wonderful!" And Horatio says, "Good, my lord, tell it." And Hamlet refuses. He says, "No, you will reveal it." Interestingly enough, here Hamlet does it. it you know, uh, he's he's really been profoundly. He, you know, his 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 confidence in human beings has been so shaken that here we can see he's not even willing to reveal what the ghost has said to him to Horatio, uh, nor to Marcellus. And we recall that Horatio and Marcellus, rather than going to the king when they witness the ghost, after all, remember. The loyalty to the duty and to the state, they should have gone to the king if uh, uh, upon seeing the ghost, but instead their loyalties were first to Hamlet. And they went to Hamlet with the news of having uh, been uh, visited by the apparition by the ghost. Uh, but Hamlet won't reveal it. And he begins to chatter away in what appear, he, again, he becomes uh, extremely excited and uh, he appears to be speaking gibberish. And at the top of page 1417, at line 133, Horatio interrupts him and, and calls out, These are but wild and whirling words, my lord. You're behaving so strangely, so bizarrely. You, you, you're, you're, you're in this disturbed, agitated state. Uh, please speak clearly. Be lucid. Uh, Try to calm down, be rational. And Hamlet says, I am sorry they offend you heartily. Yes, faith, heartily. And Hamlet says uh, next at line 137, touching this vision here, he tells Horatio and Marcellus, touching this vision here, it is an honest ghost. That, let me tell you. So Hamlet, at this moment at least, he's absolutely certain, isn't he? that the ghost was speaking the truth. The ghost, now perhaps the ghost was speaking the truth. Remember the problem of knowing the supernatural mind here. How could we ever have access to a supernatural mind uh, and know uh, if that being, uh, how could we know if that being was ab actually telling us, uh, giving us the truth, giving us the, uh, telling us uh, what was uh, real what was factual. And here we have Hamlet believing what the ghost has said. Was the, again, that question of was the ghost honest or not? And we still don't know, but Hamlet is convinced uh, the ghost uh, uh, was telling the truth. Uh, again, the ghost could have been telling the truth. It could be that the ghost is the ghost of Hamlet's father and all that occurred, all the story uh, of the murder could all be true. Or again, it could be the ghost is the goblin damned or even the devil himself come to tempt Hamlet. 
And here we see, whichever the case may be, that Hamlet has been persuaded. Uh, remember the last lecture, I mentioned a number of strategies, a number of ploys that the ghost uh, might have been, you know, goblin damned in disguise and the disguise of coming in the shape of Hamlet's father might have been using these little tricks and stratagems to, to persuade Hamlet, to tempt Hamlet. Remember, Hamlet, as a Christian, believes in this supernatural uh, uh, entity called a soul that is separate and distinct from the body and that can will either, uh, upon his death, ascend into heaven and be eternally rewarded or... Uh, uh, descend into a Christian hell and be forever uh, tortured, forever tormented. And uh, so, but here Hamlet believes the ghost, and I take him at his word here. That let me tell you, for your desire to know what is between us or mastered as you may. Again, he repeats, he's not going to reveal what the ghost has told him. Uh, and I would argue, uh, uh, that Hamlet doesn't know, you know, whom can he trust? He's got to be careful here. And uh, he doesn't want to reveal uh, the ghost message, nor does he want to reveal the ghost uh, commandment to uh, revenge uh, the ghost uh, murder. If the ghost... Uh, um, to revenge the elder King Hamlet's murder, if again King Hamlet, if he had, if indeed he had been murdered by uh, his brother. So, yes, Hamlet is suspect, isn't he? He's a bit wary here, doubtful, doesn't know exactly the people he can trust. And uh, I think that's why he wishes to keep it to himself. But he does, he, he, he demands of them that they not reveal what has occurred here to anyone. He says, never make known what you have seen tonight at line 143. Never make known by what you have seen tonight. And both agree, they, 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 they respond, my Lord, we will not. But that isn't enough for Hamlet. Again, notice how suspicious he is. He's really, again, once more, he's lost all confidence, all, all trust in human beings uh, ever since the death of his father and the behavior of those around him at court. So he demands that they swear it. Nay, but swear it. And they say, in faith, my Lord, not I. But that still isn't enough. <clears throat> he wants them to swear it upon his sword. to show that uh, as soldiers, as, as uh, the, the, they can be trusted here, that the uh, loyalty, again, that loyalty to, to the state. He wants them to swear it upon his sword. Um, and it's at that moment that we hear the ghost cry out from underneath the stage. Remember in Shakespeare's day, uh, the stage had a trap door and it was through the trap door that uh, the supernatural beings in certain of Shakespeare's plays would enter and exit. They would come up through the trap door. The witches in Macbeth, for example, the witches in Macbeth would come up through the trap door and uh, appear on the stage. And then when they exited, they would exit back down through the trap door. And so with the ghost here in Hamlet. And so the ghost, when the ghost exit the stage, he descends, he, in, he, he goes, he, he opens the trap door and descends uh, underneath the stage. It's interesting, isn't it, that we have the voice of the ghost crying out from underneath the stage. Again, a suggestion, right? Because what we associate with underneath, with below, we tend to associate, uh, many, you know, many believers, people of faith tend to associate beneath or below as the realm of... Uh, 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 the region of the Christian hell, whereas above, the, above they imagine to be the Christian heaven. So again, it alerts us sitting in the audience. Shakespeare's reminding us we can't really know for certain uh, just who 
just what the supernatural being is, where the supernatural being comes from, if the supernatural being is speaking the truth, what the being's purposes, his, his aims could be. There is no way of knowing that. And that's a problem for the person of faith, for the romantic. And in this particular case, the problem for the Christian believer. So we hear the ghost call out from beneath, uh, from underneath the stage, swear. And Hamlet, uh, you know, cries out to the ghost. Interesting, the, the terms he uses here when he refers to the ghost, he speaks directly to the ghost and says, art thou there, Trupe? He says, ha ha, boy, says thou so? He calls the ghost boy. Art thou there, true penny? And true penny. And then uh, down the page here, after the ghost cries out a second time from beneath, uh, from the cellar, uh, from beneath the trap door, swear. Uh, this time, Hamlet uh, cries out, uh, he calls him, well said, old mole. Pence work in the earth so fast, a worthy pioneer. That is a, as your footnote says here, a soldier who picks trenches. These terms that a Hamlet uses when he's addressing the ghost, isn't they not particularly terms of respect, are they? It may be revealing, although again, perhaps Hamlet's unaware, at the subconscious level, it may be revealing the doubt, the suspicion that Hamlet harbors concerning the ghost true nature concerning uh, the veracity of the ghost tale whether the ghost was genuine being sincere telling the truth about what occurred so it's just a you know a hint here an indication intimation that maybe you know this ghost is something that uh, subconsciously hamlet doesn't trust uh, that he may be suspect, uh, may be suspicious of. And that would be ironic, wouldn't it? Because earlier, just before, we've heard him in his second soliloquy. And then uh, after that, we hear him tell Horatio and Marcellus that it is an honest ghost that let me tell you. But Hamlet, you know, and crying out and calling out and uh, in, in uh, speaking to the ghost, Horatio... Horatio yet again says at line 164, Oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange. Uh, Horatio still is just, uh, he's just in shock. He, he can't believe, uh, he doesn't understand. He can't comprehend why Hamlet is behaving the way he's behaving. He's acting, you know, uh, in, in such a strange way. He's acting bizarrely, isn't he? He's seems to have lost all control of his ability to uh, to reason and, and to remain rational. And look at Hamlet's response. Uh, Horatio says again at line 164, so, oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange. And Hamlet re responds, and therefore as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And here by your philosophy, I don't think he's referring to Horatio's philosophy. I think he's just meaning uh, Hamlet uh, referring to philosophy in general, the philosophy that, they're, that they've been studying uh, at school together. Both Horatio and uh, Hamlet, of course, are students at Wittenberg at, at, at the university. And they've been studying philosophy. And here many critics will step in. Well, uh, yeah, I say many, but some critics will step in uh, and say, here, you know, is proof positive that Shakespeare basically is saying, look, we need uh, uh, to keep an open mind when it comes to the supernatural world, that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And uh, I would simply, you know, I would dismiss that idea that we need to keep the open mind uh, with regards to, that the play is saying we need to keep an open mind with regards to the supernatural realm existing. Uh, the realist would uh, argue that, uh, uh, that there simply isn't any evidence or proof. 
that uh, such a realm exists, and certainly no philosophical argument that can that is uh, rational and sound can be made in support of a supernatural realm. And I think the uh, what Shakespeare is doing here again is uh, I think this is a moment another moment of irony, and Shakespeare is reminding us that we're we're uh, uh, looking at a fictional world. The Hamletian world is not the real world, but rather a fictional world. And that in the real world, that uh, uh, philosophy, if it's done correctly, uh, derives its truths, determines its truths uh, from the scientific facts. Um, and uh, it's the fictional world here. It's Shakespeare's way of reminding us again that what we're looking at is a fictional world and uh, not at, uh, uh, we're not, uh, this is not a world uh, where um, the scientific method is being employed and through induction we come up with, uh, you know, through scientific induction we we discover uh, 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 the facts, and then through rational deduction, we we arrive at the truths. So yeah, I would say that Shakespeare's reminding us that the ghost is a fiction, that it's his invention. And uh, when Hamlet cries out here, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy, uh, Shakespeare is... It's uh, uh, undercutting that remark. He's undermining that remark uh, that Hamlet is making here as a reminder that this isn't the world of reality we find ourselves in, but the world of fiction. Um, on page 418, after Horatio, uh, once again, you know, uh, he, what does he say? Oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange. And remember earlier his words, these are but wild and whirling words, my Lord. After uh, uh, Horatio repeats this idea that Hamlet is acting uh, you know, so oddly here, ha uh, Hamlet says at the top of page 1418, but come, here is before, never, so help you mercy, how strange or odd some air I bear myself. However strange he behaves, however odd he behaves. And then look what he says in this parenthetical aside here. As I perchance hereafter shall think meet to put an antic disposition on, that you know, to note that you know aught of me, this do swear. So Hamlet basically, to paraphrase here, Hamlet saying, look, no matter how strangely I behave, no matter how oddly I behave, and uh, I don't want you to think, I don't want you to note that you know anything of what's occurred tonight, that uh, we have been visited by a ghost and that I went off privately with the ghost and communicated with the ghost uh, 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 separately. I don't want you to reveal any of that to anyone. And I want you to swear that this do swear. And they, yet, they swear must, once again. And here Hamlet gets the idea of uh, putting on an antic disposition, as I perchance hereafter shall think meet, shall think it uh, necessary uh, to put an antic disposition on. By an antic disposition, what he means is, if I pretend to feign madness or insanity, if I appear to act deranged, uh, if I appear to be mentally unstable, I don't want you to think that I am, that it's merely an act, it's merely a guise, a kind of mask that I'm going to assume, that I'll wear. But I'm not really mad. I'm not really insane. I haven't lost my marbles. Uh, I'm still perfectly you know, uh, rational. I have my rational faculties. Uh, why would Hamlet want to put on this antic disposition? Why would he want to pretend? Why would he want to feign madness? Because you would think it, uh, you know, he's already got, uh, he's already alerted Claudius. And uh, 
he's troubled. He, his mother's troubled by his behavior, and Claudius has been alerted by his behavior. And this would seem to simply draw more attention uh, to Hamlet if he were suddenly to be uh, begin acting as if he had lost his his faculties, his rational uh, capacities. So why would he behave like this? Interesting. I think first is a practical reason, and that is. He doesn't want Horatio and Marcellus to reveal anything to the king. And remember that uh, Horatio was the one who warned Hamlet and said that perhaps this ghost might tempt you to the cliff and there assume some horrible shape and tempt you, draw you into madness. And the idea of demonic possession, uh, belief that in Shakespeare's day and even today, uh, many people of, of religious uh, belief, uh, religious faith, believe in demonic possession, believe that uh, uh, people can be uh, possessed by devils, by the devil himself, perhaps. And the last thing Hamlet wants is for Horatio and Marcellus or any of the other guards to go to the king and say, Look what's happened. Look what's occurred. We were visited by a ghost who came in the shape of the elder King Hamlet. And the young prince had a private communication, had pri a private communication with the ghost. And now he's behaving strangely and perhaps he's possessed. I mean, out of anxiety for Hamlet, Horatio and the guards might go to the king. And this is the last thing that Hamlet wants. He doesn't want Claudius to know that a ghost who's come in, uh, who, uh, a ghost has appeared before Hamlet and had a private meeting with Hamlet. Uh, uh, if Claudius is guilty of the crime, then Claudius certainly doesn't want uh, the ghost of the elder King Hamlet uh, to have appeared and uh, talked with Hamlet privately. Uh, that would certainly be of great concern to Claudius. Uh, but more importantly, I think it gets back to this idea, this other causal factor that's going to cause Hamlet to lie. And that is the argument I made uh, uh, in the earlier lecture that Hamlet is a man of revenge, that he wants those around him to suffer because he himself is suffering. He wants in particular Claudius and his mother to suffer. He wants to cause them harm. He wants to cause them pain. And by assuming, and but remember, he can't openly accuse them. He can't be honest with them and tell them what he's feeling. Remember at the close of his first soliloquy, he says, uh, but break my heart for I must hold my tongue. No matter how disturbed and upset he is, how troubled he is by their behavior, he has to remain quiet. Break his, he has to suffer uh, alone. He must hold his tongue, not only because he owes a loyalty to the state, a duty to the state. He needs to serve Denmark and therefore he needs to be loyal to the king, but he also owes it to his mother. He needs to honor her, respect her wishes. Uh, so he has to remain silent. He can't, again, let others know how he's truly feeling, how truly deeply disappointed he is in them, how their behavior just absolutely disgusts him. They're having forgotten so, so quickly. Uh, their seeming indifference to uh, his father's death. But here, under the guise of madness, what an opportunity for him. What a chance here at last, because he could, right? He could here begin to say things, begin to speak out, become more direct. And he could always, it could always be under uh, uh, the protection of, of this, this idea that he's, he's not himself. He's, he's lost his, his mind. He's, he's, he's become insane. He's, he's descended into madness and and therefore, he, he isn't responsible for what he says, for what he uh, accuses others of around him. This would be a perfect opportunity for him to let out all of that resentment and that, that hostility and that anger. 
finally he can release some of that. And we're going to see him do that in, uh, in, over the course of the next uh, several acts in the play. He's going to take that opportunity under uh, the mask of madness, if you will. He's going to take that opportunity to lash out and to hurt those, to cause pain to those who have caused pain to him. And remember, I've argued that this is one of the causes for his delay, that he is actually, yes, he is a man of vengeance. He does allow his psychological desires, his needs to trump his, or I shouldn't say allow. That suggests that uh, he has the freedom to choose, doesn't it? But his psychological desires, his needs, uh, uh, do allow, uh, do uh, ultimately trump his ability to be rational, his, his uh, Trump, his, uh, uh, his reasoning, right? You should realize that a brain in pain is a brain in pain. And whether it's his brain or someone else's brain, that rationally speaking, it doesn't matter. It's uh, pain is intrinsically bad. Uh, so <clears throat> Hamlet makes them swear and they will not reveal any of the happenings, uh, anything that's occurred between Hamlet and the ghost. They won't reveal to anyone and they won't uh, run to the king or the queen and, uh, you know, anxiously and, and uh, um, reveal that they, they suspect or they fear that perhaps Hamlet has become possessed. Their loyalty will be to Hamlet first, and they have been asked to swear it. So uh, here ends Act uh, uh, Act One, and when we see Hamlet next, when we first see him next in Act Two, where what do we find him doing? It's just a an interesting. Uh, stage direction on Shakespeare's part. If you turn to act two, scene two, and recall between acts one and two, approximately two months have passed. And where do we find Hamlet? What's Hamlet been doing all of this time? He certainly hasn't uh, 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 fulfilled the ghost uh, injunction, the ghost order. And instead, well, what do we find Hamlet doing when we see him first in Act Two when he enters the stage? And on page 1425, toward the bottom of the page, Hamlet enters reading a book. And here again uh, is, is evidence in the text here to support this, this, uh, uh, this last causal feature that I've uh, introduced, and that is that Hamlet is a man of introspection, a man of reflection, that he reads a great deal, he thinks a great deal, he philosophizes a great deal, and here he is reading a book. That's where we find Hamlet. We don't find the, he's not the ancient Greek or the ancient Roman uh, avenger here. He hasn't uh, fulfilled his duty. Instead, He's become distracted. And uh, in the scene with Polonius here, we find Hamlet feigning madness, uh, putting on the antic disposition, and uh, it permits him to uh, say rather cruel things to Polonius, who, who uh, believes it's all because Hamlet is pining for Ophelia, is in love with Ophelia. We'll come back to Polonius later. Instead, I would like, for the time being, let's turn our attention to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Uh, and we'll discuss Polonius uh, uh, at a later time here in a later lecture. Uh, but for right now, I would like to turn to page 1427, Act 2, Scene 2. Remember Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, they are childhood. They, they, they've been friends of Hamlet ever since childhood, and uh, Hamlet is very close to them, and they've been away from court, and the king and queen have summoned them to court, summoned them back to court, 
uh, we know uh, uh, for the purpose of trying to ferret out, trying to understand what's going on in Hamlet's brain, who's there, um, which might be difficult to do because Hamlet himself isn't quite sure, is he? He's wanting to know, and is it right? He wants to know what's going on in his own brain, who's there. He himself uh, is conflicted. Uh, uh, many of the the conflicts he's experiencing operating at the subconscious level. He's unaware, but he is, he does, right? He, he, he has what he calls in that great metaphor, uh, his, his brain is distracted, his distracted globe. Remember again, uh, the idea that uh, this is the world that each of us lives in. We, we are our brains. Uh, when I say we live in our brains, I, I don't mean to imply that uh, there is uh, a self or an I or uh, uh, living within the brain, pulling all the levers and the switches and controlling the brain. No, we are our brains. Unfortunately, the language that we have is corrupt and we use words like I and self and uh, uh, you know you and such words, but Science tells us that we are our brains, that if we were to open each of our heads up, we would see inside nothing but gray matter, a great big gooey glob of uh, uh, gray matter, a, a vast neural network, uh, these specialized cells called neurons that transmit nerve impulses. That's what we find, physical stuff only within. There is no little I or little you inside our brains. Uh, but we live, I'm going to say it again, our brains, right, are modeling the world around us. And some brains model that world more effectively than others. Some brains have a more precise, a more accurate model of the world around them. And some brains have a rather distorted uh, or, or, or model, a, a corrupted uh, by desires. And uh, Hamlet's brain is distracted. He is confused. He is conflicted. Uh, and his, his distracted globe, uh, these deterministic causes, many of them are operating at the subconscious level. For example, uh, this, uh, uh, this loss of his immortality project. I don't think he's aware uh, of... Uh, that particular problem existing, uh, that that particular loss, uh, or the the contradictions within the ghost message itself, that we discuss several contradictions, and we'll return to some of those contradictions, and uh, I'll introduce a few more as well. But all of these uh, contradictions in the ghost uh, injunction, the ghost message, uh, are again disturbing Hamlet, um, they're un, are in his brain and they're, right, they're, they're causing him to, causing his brain to be distracted and all, all is chaotic within. He's not, uh, he, he's not modeling the world accurately. His brain is not modeling the world accurately. Here in Act 2, Scene 2, we meet Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Again, they've been commanded by the Queen and Queen, the King and Queen, to return to court. And they want Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to try to attempt to find out just exactly what, why is Hamlet behaving uh, uh, so strangely? So, uh, 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 what is troubling Hamlet? Is it, is it that Hamlet is uh, pining for Ophelia? Uh, is it uh, love for Ophelia? Is that what's causing him to behave this way? This is what Polonius thinks. The king and queen are unsure, but they do want to know. And so they've called upon Rosencrantz and Guildenstern uh, to, to spy on Hamlet, if you will, to go about this fair and, you know, to see if they can find out without alerting Hamlet to what, what it is, uh, what their purpose is, to see if they can find out what's causing Hamlet such anxiety, such uh, what's troubling him. 
Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, if you will, they're sort of between a rock and a hard place, aren't they? They're in a really tight spot because, again, they owe their loyalty to the king and the queen. And if they're commanded, if this is an order that they've been given, then they have to fulfill their duty. Um, but on the other hand, right, they're friends of Hamlet, and I'm sure they care for Hamlet. They're concerned about him. So the idea of having to spy on their friends, it really puts them in an awkward, a very difficult situation here. But when Hamlet first sees them, look, he's, we get a, a nice touch in the play, isn't it? We get a, an indication of what Hamlet was like before the death of his father and before everyone um, uh, at court disappointed Hamlet. Uh, we get an intimation here, a hint at what Hamlet was like. Look at, at page 1427, around line 220, Act 2, Scene 2. Uh, Guildenstern and Rosencrantz uh, enter the stage as Polonius exit, and Guildenstern cries out, my honored Lord, Rosencrantz, my most dear Lord, and look at Hamlet's response, my excellent good friends, how dost thou, Guildenstern, our oh, Rosencrantz, good lads, how do you both? I mean, he seems genuinely excited, happy to see his childhood friends here, doesn't he? They've obviously been away from court for some time, and he this is the former Hamlet, but this is the Hamlet we imagined, you know, the, the Hamlet who trusted human beings, had confidence in them, thought that they were essentially good. Uh, human beings were essentially, basically, deep down good and could be trusted. And uh, Hamlet wants to know, uh, he, Hamlet wants to know why they've come to Denmark. And Hamlet, here are the famous line, he wants to know at line 138 or so, what have you, my good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither? Denmark is a prison. And Guildenstern doesn't know it's prison, my lord. Hamlet's famous line, Denmark's a prison. Now, I don't think Hamlet, of course, is, the metaphor here is not uh, in the sense that I uh, was thinking about it, you know, that Hamlet's trapped, uh, the thesis that we're exploring that Hamlet is trapped in a deterministic prison. Hamlet sees Denmark as a prison because physically he can't escape from prison, from Denmark. He wants to get away from uh, the court. He wants to return to the university. And he's feeling trapped like a prisoner in Denmark. And uh, uh, Rosencrantz says, then is the world one, and the world must be a prison if you think Denmark's a prison. And Hamlet agrees, look, a goodly one in which there are many confines, wards, and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. So all the world's a prison, a goodly one, a great prison, in which there are all sorts of dungeons and torture chambers and, and cells and so forth. And here the idea, once again, that Hamlet is trapped in this world. It's this world that so disappoints Hamlet. This tragic plot line, remember, unfolding before him. It's this world that Hamlet is disillusioned with and the people in this world who have so disappointed him. He's not at all what he imagined them to be. Uh, and so the world itself is a prison from which he can't escape. Where we recall that Hamlet uh, is not permitted to take his own life. He's not permitted to exit the stage because of his Christian beliefs. The idea that to do so would be a mortal sin and punishable uh, by eternal damnation. So Hamlet is stuck. He is trapped here in Denmark, in, on the planet, in this world itself. It is a prison. But Hamlet insists he wants to know. Uh, well, before that, uh, he's, uh, uh, Rosencrantz disagrees here. He's, uh, Rosencrantz says, uh, the world a prison? Denmark a prison? Denmark the worst prison? He says, Rosencrantz uh, responds, we think not so, my lord. And Hamlet says these uh, famous lines from the play, why then tis none to you, for there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. There's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And unfortunately, this is taught in a lot of college philosophy courses, this idea of relativism, that all is relative, that uh, nothing's either good or bad. It's just uh, from a person's particular perspective. 
how you call it, the subjective view. Uh, and of course, uh, it's certainly this idea that nothing's either good or bad, that certainly can't uh, be true. Something can be either good or bad when it comes to controversial issues. Now, when it comes to trivial issues, obviously, yes, people have opinions, these trivial issues, these issues that don't matter. I might think broccoli tastes better than spinach. You might think spinach tastes better than broccoli. Who cares? No one's going to philosophize. No one's going to argue over these issues. No one with, uh, you know, uh, uh, any intelligence is going to argue is pink prettier than blue. Which is the prettier color, pink or blue? And I say it's blue and you say it's pink and uh, we debate and we argue which is prettier. No. Pink can be prettier in my view, and blue can be prettier in yours, and so forth. So these trivial issues no one cares about. But when it comes to these uh, most important truths, yeah, you know, there are, there is, it's not a question of a person's uh, perspective. There are objective truths. There is good and there is bad, and that's based on the scientific evidence and and uh, remember, I said in class that it begins with this, you know, one day you, you become conscious and you become aware that you exist in the world and you realize that you experience, uh, that your brain experiences states of dissatisfaction, that you can suffer, that you can be in pain. And pain has real value as opposed to projected value. Uh, let's discuss this idea of real versus projected value. Uh, but pain is, in and of itself, it's intrinsically bad uh, uh, for a conscious feeling organism. It's, uh, pain is uh, essentially bad. It's something that uh, our brains attempt. Uh, that's uh, how uh, or why organisms evolve. They were able, this reward and punishment system, right? Brains, basically their primary function Brains de detect what kinds of problems exist there in the world, and the brains go about attempting to resolve those problems. What kind of needs or lacks or wants that the organism is experiencing and how to fix those problems, resolve them, or at least reduce those states of dissatisfaction. So we are born into these, this, this, these, brain, with these with these various brain states. We are born into this need this state of dissatisfaction in our brains attempt to, like a detective, like Sherlock Holmes, our brains are detecting the problems, constantly detecting problems and or trying to resolve them. If I do this, I may not be aware that I'm scratching, but my brain has detected a problem that something's disturbing, right? My skin here, that uh, an itch perhaps, or something's irritating it. My brain is attempting to resolve the problem. We have these biological uh, states of dissatisfaction that our brains attempt to resolve, these biological drives, what motivates us, right? We have to breathe air. Our brains require oxygen. Uh, we have, we, we, our brain, we, our, our bodies need water. Our bodies need food. Our bodies have to maintain a comfortable temperature or they can't become too cold or too hot. Uh, therefore, we need shelter and clothes. We need some sort of protection from the elements. Uh, as we mature, our, uh, our brains, uh, you know, uh, the, the hormones, uh, the sexual hormones kick in and we, our brains become sexually frustrated, so they seek sex. Uh, so these problems, we have these biological problems, this, these continuous problems that our brains are constantly having to meet. And uh, we have, in addition, we have psychological needs, desires as well. We have Freud's ego. Remember this idea that each of us wants to uh, uh, feel as if we matter. We want to feel significant, that our lives are meaningful, that we're somehow relevant. None of us wants to be perceived as a loser. We want to see ourselves as winners, as winning this game of existence. And... Uh, so we go about trying to, oh, kind of immortality project, right? Trying to make names for ourselves, trying to feel, uh, trying to be uh, uh, important, 
trying to stand out. We're very competitive we're as social animals, right? We're competitive with one another and we want to feel as if we matter, that uh, uh, we are uh, special, that we are unique. So we have our ego to contend with. And then, of course, we have our cultural addictions, our cultural dependencies. None of us is raised in a vacuum. We're raised by particular people in a particular environment, a particular culture. And we have particular experiences. And our culture subscribes to particular beliefs. And uh, many people buy into these beliefs unthinkingly. Uh, and they become dependent. They become addicted to these particular beliefs. Uh, we mentioned several in classes, illustrations, breeding uh, animals for human pets. That's a, a cultural dependency that many people uh, are addicted. They become dependent on uh, having pets. Although we can, we I made the argument that it's both irrational and unethical to do so. Or we see, for example, participating in sports. Uh, despite the harm, the, the unnecessary harm that it causes to children. You know, children are severely injured and they're paralyzed and they're killed, uh, uh, you know, on football fields and on hockey rinks and in the gym, gymnastics class. Uh, and so, uh, but many people, they, they become addicted to sports because they were raised in a culture that idolizes sports and sports heroes or worship sports. And so they become dependent and addicted to sports, even though we can see the unnecessary harm that it causes. It causes much more harm uh, than, than benefits. Uh, or we, and we've talked about several issues, uh, eating meat, for example, or uh, again, an irrational uh, behavior and unethical, or the, the arguments that I made in class, or we talked about uh, hunting and fishing, uh, you know, harming, uh, ruining the day of some conscious feeling organism, a brain that can be in pain, or that has a welfare state just like ours. And yet for our own, our own psychological needs, our own cultural addictions, we hunt them, we fish for pleasure uh, when we don't need to do so. It's unnecessary. We talked about bringing children into the world, for example, again, psychological desire, the cultural influences, the idea that, you know, it's, it, the idea of having children is promoted, and yet we see that it causes all sorts of unnecessary harm and risk, and that there's no need to, to do so. So these cultural dependencies uh, and the psychological desires and these biological needs the, the states of dissatisfaction that uh, conscious sentient beings find themselves in that have to be met, uh, pain, again, is intrinsically bad. Nothing's either good or bad, but thinking makes it so? No, pain is bad. And I think most of us realize that once we become conscious and are aware that we exist in the world and that we can have these states of pain, uh, very few people are... Who can seriously admit that they would enjoy having, for example, uh, uh, their tooth, a cavity drilled without Novocaine? That they would enjoy that, that it's neither good or bad, but only thinking makes it so, whether that pain is good or bad. Uh, I, I would say that someone who argues that is being disingenuous, is, is, is not being honest. Uh, which would you rather have, your tooth drilled on, a cavity drilled on without Novocaine, or would you rather have, you know, uh, sit down to a, uh, would you rather have a lollipop? I think most people would say, I'd rather have the lollipop rather than having my tooth drilled on, a cavity drilled on without, uh, you know, some sort of painkiller, because pain in and of itself is bad. And so we know that there are things that are good, things that are bad, based on this scientific observation. And I have a brain, I experience pain, and you have a brain. Other conscious sentient beings have brains. From all that I can observe, their brains are doing the same thing that my brains are doing. They're detecting problems in the world, and they're trying, like Sherlock Holmes, they're detecting those problems, and they're trying to resolve those problems. They're running from the whips. They don't like these states of 
unease, whether it be psychological unease or physical unease. The brain just doesn't like being in pain. And all the evidence points, there's no evidence to suggest that other people's brains, other animals' brains aren't doing the exact same thing that your brain's doing and that my brain's doing. To try to rationalize our way, rationalize our way around that scientific fact seems somehow, you know, it just can't be done. I would argue that it simply can't be done. Uh, and then the truths that we derive, what's of most value, how should we conduct ourselves from those facts. Um, so we do, we've determined the philosophical truth that slavery is bad. It isn't simply a question of thinking that it's good or bad. From the slave owner's perspective, the slave owner could say, well, it's perfectly, uh, it's highly productive and it benefits me in many ways. But uh, the slave owner is not thinking rationally. A brain in pain is a brain in pain, and that has a value. That's of most value. Uh, sexism is bad. Racism is bad. Homophobia is bad. Speciesism is bad. These things are bad. Rape is bad. People don't have a right if it's attached to an unnecessary harm. You don't have a right to do something if it's attached to a wrong and a necessary harm. We discussed this before in class. Child molestation is bad. It isn't, a, it isn't the idea that from the child molester's perspective, it's perfectly good because I would argue that the child molester then is getting it wrong. Doesn't, can't add one plus one equals two. Can't realize that a brain in pain is a brain in pain. The child molester would not like his brain in pain. He understands that idea of brain being in pain. And it's just the same thing that's happening. Rationally speaking, there's no difference between someone else's brain in pain and the child molester's brain in pain. And therefore, the child molester would not want to be molested. So therefore, the child molester has to become civilized, has to be, be ethical and not molest the child. So yes, we can discover these most important truths. It isn't simply a question of, uh, 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 of nothing's either good or bad. Pain has real value. Now, projected value, remember, that many times is, is, uh, is psychological need or biological need. Uh, there's no value, for example, the heroin addict, there's no value in heroin itself. Heroin has absolutely no value in and of itself. It's a projected value, and only the heroin addict has that, holds heroin, believes heroin to have value. He projects value onto heroin because the heroin addict is addicted to it right? Biologically addicted to it. It's a drug. Uh, the movie star who wants to win the Academy Award, the Academy Award has no real value. Like pain and suffering is of real value. The Academy Award, the statue in and of itself has no real value. The value exists only in the brain of the, Academy, the movie star who wants that Academy Award. It's a psychological need, a desire. It's maybe his or her immortality project has to have it. But the award itself, and for anyone who doesn't care about Academy Awards, it has absolutely no value whatsoever. The only value is in the pain that the movie star's brain suffers if she doesn't win the award. That's where the real value lies. We would have to try to show her and convince her that it's just a psychological need, a fixation, an addiction she has. Or maybe she's been raised in a particular, uh, maybe she's been raised in Hollywood, a particular culture that says to be great is to win an Oscar. So it's a cultural dependency or addiction that she has but it has no real value in and of itself. Uh, football is a cultural dependency. It is not, it has no intrinsic value. Football in and of itself is unimportant, no value whatsoever. It's only of value to the football player or to the football fan. 
Anybody who doesn't care about football, if football were to disappear from the face of the earth tomorrow, they just wouldn't matter to them. Wouldn't matter to them at all. Because football uh, is, is a sport. It's a projected value. It's a cultural addiction. The pain that a child, a little league, a child playing little league football, the pain when a child's neck is broken on the football field and the child becomes paralyzed for life, that has real value. That trumps the projected value, the desire, the psychological desire or the cultural addiction, because that has real, it trumps the psychological pain that the football fan would experience if football were suddenly. To, to, to be outlawed. So you can see what has real value as opposed to projected value. Um, yeah, I think that's important here. There's a tendency uh, for many critics whenever, uh, whenever Hamlet philosophizes, whenever he makes some sort of philosophical pronouncement, there's a tendency for many critics who I would argue themselves aren't particularly deep thinkers to think, ah, this is what Shakespeare thinks. And this is what Hamlet speaks here is the truth. Remember Hamlet says, there's more on, in heaven and earth, Horatio, than dreamt of in your philosophy. And many scholars and critics and audience members say, ah, yes, here's what Shakespeare's saying. Yes. We should keep our minds, we should keep our, 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 our brains open to the possibility that the supernatural realm exists. No, Shakespeare's saying, you, know, you won't keep an open mind to the point that your brain falls out of your head. The, the realist would argue, and I'm arguing that these plays are, re, are, are uh, pictures of reality, not of the romantic, the psychological uh, uh, desire for uh, you know, a fairy tale world and a fairy tale existence. So when Hamlet says nothing's either good or bad, but thinking makes it so, you know, the philosophy teacher might stand up and say, ah, this is known as relativism. And this is certainly true. No. You've gotten the scientific facts wrong. If you got the facts wrong, you can't, there's no way that you, you know, philosophy is derived from those facts. So you're not, you're not philosophizing. If you think that nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so when it comes to these really when it comes to harm and pain, when it comes to these serious, these controversial issues, these most important truths, these most important values, there's a good and there's a bad. We have to simply add the facts together and we can determine what's good, what's bad. Slavery's bad. Bad. Racism, sexism, bad. Bad, bad. We can determine. So I'll leave you here. Uh, uh, and uh, next time we'll look at one of the most famous speeches in the play. So read ahead of time for the next lecture uh, on page 1328, toward the bottom of the page. This is a very famous speech of Hamlet's. Look through that beginning at line 289. You want to look at that passage in particular. And I'd also like you to look at the passages concerning uh, Hamlet and his, uh, his greeting of the company of actors, the troupe of traveling actors, uh, and the speech that Hamlet asked the first player to perform. Look through that particular speech. And if we have time in the next lecture, we'll finish Act Two by looking at Hamlet's third soliloquy at the end of Act Two. So look at those passages in particular. We'll be talking about those, and I'll get to this problem of nihilism uh, in the next lecture as well. Hamlet is about uh, about to meet uh, this, this group of actors traveling throughout Denmark and they've arrived at the court of uh, the palace of Elsinore, they've arrived at court and you're going to, you're about to see a different Hamlet, a Hamlet you haven't seen before. You're going to see a Hamlet who suddenly, it appears that he has found once again, something of interest in this world. Because when the actors appear, when they enter the stage, 
Hamlet suddenly becomes a changed man, becomes an enthused man, an excited man, and he wants the actors to perform for him. This is a man who seems yet to find something of interest in this world. Be gone.